Welcome everybody to our meeting. Uh, welcome to the Texas RIAs. Texas RIAs is the largest network of real estate investor associations in the great state of Texas. Uh, I'm Phil Grove, a member and one of the co-founders of the Texas RIAs. And uh, what we do is we have meetings all over Texas, Austin, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio. We have over 100,000 members uh, and participants and attendees. And we provide services to real estate investors, a network and a community where people can collaborate, learn, partner, uh, borrow, lend, uh, get power teams and other uh, resources that are helpful for being real estate investors. And one of the other things that we provide that the community is market information. In fact, every month we publish market data to show everybody what's going on in the real estate market. So of course, when it comes to real estate investing, what is the big story? What is the big story? What do you think? Interest rates, interest rates. Okay, so interest rates have changed. So, so what are interest rates? Are, are interest rates high or low right now? High. Who thinks interest rates are high? Raise your hand if you think interest rates are high. Who thinks interest rates are low? Raise your hand if you think interest rates are low. Who's not listening to me right now? Because I only got about 10% of you voted either way. Okay, here's my perspective. Uh, I would say, my opinion, interest rates are normal, okay? I've been doing this for 20 years, right? When I started investing in real estate for years and years and years, most of my properties I've owned for 20 years have six and a half, seven and a half percent mortgages. That's called normal interest rates. Now, for those of you that have been just kind of paying attention to this real estate thing for the last couple of years, right? We had for a brief period of time there, freakishly abnormal interest rates. Interest rates that it's very likely you will never see again in your lifetime, possibly never see again in your children's lifetime, right? Three, four, five percent more, that's not normal. Those are, that's freakishly abnormal. When I graduated from college, when I bought my first home, I was not a real estate investor, I was an engineer back then, but interest rates in 1981 got all the way up to 18%. So for you guys that are complaining about 7.5% mortgages, imagine if the mortgages were 18%. Then you'd be saying, oh, interest rates are low, right? So yeah, it's just a perspective. And that's really all it is, right? Compared to what it was, it's higher. Uh, compared to what it was before that, it's normal. Uh, compared to 1981, it's freakishly low. Uh, but I would really describe it by historical standards as normal. So we're back into a normal real estate market. Uh, we were in an abnormal market for a little while there. But don't be afraid of interest rates. They're just normal. And for most of decades and decades and decades of real estate investors investing in real estate, this is what it looks like in a normal market. So we're no longer abnormal, but we're normal. Now, when interest rates go up, what happens to home prices? What do you think? When interest rates go up, does it make home prices go up or down? Does it make, who thinks it makes home prices go down? Raise your hand. Who thinks it makes home prices go up? Raise your hand. Okay, wow, you all think it makes it go down. Here's what interest rates do to home prices. It makes them go up and down at the same time, right? Now, there are upward and there are downward forces on the real estate. And I'll tell you something about real estate, having been doing this for 20 years. Here's the thing about real estate. Real estate doesn't care much about interest rates, and I'll show you why in a minute. It really doesn't care about the economy. People think it cares about the economy. Not really. During the Great Depression, the Great Depression, real estate prices went down a whopping 6%, nothing. During the great pandemic, we just lived through that, a one in a hundred year pandemic, right? During the great pandemic, interest rates went up 30%. It's not the economy, right, that drives interest rates. Uh, so then what drives, I'm sorry, that drives real estate prices. So then what drives real estate prices? Real estate, here's what real estate cares about, supply and demand. It's the purest market there is, supply and demand. Okay, when there's more demand uh, than there is supply, prices go up. When there's more supply than there is demand, prices go down. That's it. 
like 2008, what happened? The real estate market crashed in 2008. Why? Well, it's pretty obvious when you look back and see it. 2002, three, four, five, six, seven, right? We had something called subprime lending. Instead of requiring people to have jobs and credit and income in order to borrow money, you simply went into a bank and they held a mirror under your notes. And if they saw fog, you got the loan, right? That was the loan application process back in 2005, six, and seven, right? And it turns out that was a really stupid way to give out money because in 2008, all of the banks went bankrupt. You know, the government <clears throat> actually changed the definition of bankruptcy in 2008, all that mark to market stuff that was toying with the definition, but by any real definition, the banks went bankrupt and they bounced along the bottom and eventually they got back into the lending business. But up until 2008, money was free and loose and easy. So anybody that wanted to borrow money could borrow all the money they want. <clears throat> and what did the builders do? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's something in my throat. The banks borrowed tons of money. And they built houses as far as the eye could see. And if you look at housing starts 2003, four, five, six, seven, off the charts, we're still not caught up to it, off the charts. So they were building houses as far as the eye could see. <clears throat> and then who was buying all those houses? Subprime borrowers, because anybody could get a loan. So the banks were giving out free money to the builders to build the houses and then free money to the buyers to buy the houses. And it all worked great for a few years there. And then in 2008, it just stopped. Lending stopped. It didn't slow down, it hit a wall. It just stopped, right? And when lending just stopped, what happened, right? All the buyers just stopped, they just disappeared. You couldn't get a loan in 2008. I'm exaggerating, but just a little bit. Uh, but they had all these houses that needed to be sold. Huge supply and demand just stopped. And when you had a mountain of supply and no more demand, crash, the market crashed. Well, after the banks got back into the lending business, they weren't as free and easy as they were before. Now it's a lot more challenging to get a loan. And it's even in recent years when money was cheap, you still have to have credit, job income. It's not as easy as it used to be to get a loan. So building has been building but they haven't been keeping up. And if you look at the United States on a whole, we are actually in the middle of a housing shortage. Did you know that? Some of you may have read about that. We actually have six million more buyers than we have houses available, okay? So we have a housing shortage. Now, normally when you have a housing shortage, right, more demand than supply, that pushes prices up. <clears throat> So yeah, we have upward force <clears throat> on prices. And Thomas, Thomas, I gotta get something to uh, eat. <clears throat> I got something in my throat, like potato chips or something. Uh, so if you can get me something I can uh, chew on like potato chips or something, it'll, it'll help me clear my throat. <laughs> no, I, I'm serious, it's a speaker trick. Uh, potato chips have a certain amount of coarseness, but they have an oil and it, it coats your throat. So believe it or not, if you're ever publicly speaking, and your throat gets hoarse, you eat potato chips. It's a trick. Um, I'm, I'm not just liking potato chips, so. <laughs> so yeah, the housing shortage is pushing prices up, but then we have something else going on, and that is interest rates have gone up, and when interest rates go up, houses are less affordable, right? So fewer people can actually afford to buy a house. So the number of buyers has gone down, and that pushes prices down. So you have certain things pushing prices up and you have other forces pushing prices down. And when all of those forces get pushed together into a blender, what happens? Well, I'm gonna show you what's going on in Texas. Across the great state of Texas, prices are down a whopping 1%. Nothing. The market is flat, uh, flat as a pancake. Now, I will say each city is a little different and we'll dive into some of the details for some of the different cities uh, in a minute. Now, the volume of sales is down. What does that mean? There's fewer sellers, there's fewer buyers. So the number of houses being bought and sold is down. It's gone down, but the prices are flat or really down 1%, which I consider completely 
uh, flat. And again, we'll dive into the details uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. Now, there is something else going on <clears throat> with the buyers and the sellers. All of the buyers who bought their house or refinanced their house in the last several years, when interest rates were freakishly low, right? They got those three, four, five percent mortgages, and the sellers don't want to sell, right? Uh, and what's interesting is usually two thirds of houses that are sold are just resale houses. People selling their house so they can buy another house. That's two thirds of houses, and about a third of houses that sell are new houses, new construction but that's actually now reversed, right? Because what's happened is resale houses are not selling. Nobody wants to sell because if I sell my house where I got my three, four, 5% mortgage, I'm gonna have to get a new mortgage to buy another house, thank you. And my new mortgage is gonna be like 7% or more. And I don't wanna pay 7% or more. So resellers are holding back, right? So that's constricting the supply, which is pushing prices up. But the builders are filling the gap because new construction is flying off the shelf because we still have a pretty strong uh, market. But then there's something else going on. It's getting harder and more expensive to get money. So building is slowing down. And if building doesn't keep up because we already have a housing shortage, eventually that's gonna push prices higher. So what's gonna happen? Nobody knows what the future holds exactly. Uh, and by the way, I hope I can present this in a credible way, in a non-biased way. I'm not here to sell you anything. I don't have a vested interest in trying to convince you that the market's going up or down or sideways, okay? I have strategies as a real estate investor where I can make money in up markets, down markets, and sideways markets. Sometimes it's easy to buy and hard to sell. Sometimes it's easy to sell and hard to buy. It's never easy to buy and easy to sell. But I will say my general preference is I prefer when it's easy to buy. And it hasn't been easy to buy for the last several years, but it's getting easier, which for me as a real estate investor, I actually am kind of excited that the market is no longer on fire, that the market has settled down. What is it gonna do in the future? Nobody knows for sure, but we can make some educated bets. Now, when it comes to the stock market, I have no idea. I do not believe it's even possible to predict the stock market. It's completely speculative. When it comes to the economy, I really have no idea. I think it's almost impossible to predict the economy. Real estate, on the other hand, is not so complex. And the reason is because all real estate cares about is supply and demand. And those are pretty predictable because we know how many people are having babies and we know how many people are moving to Texas. So we know how many people need a place to live, and we even know how many houses that we have for them to live in, and we even know how many housing starts, how many buildings are under construction. So we have all the data, right? We have it all, and it's not that hard to predict. Now, what's gonna happen in the future? I don't know, right? A lot of experts think that interest rates may peak up a little bit more, but then a lot of the experts think then they're gradually gonna to start to come down again. If real estate prices do gradually start to come down again, that's gonna put upward forces on real estate. So because it's gonna increase the demand and we're not increasing the supply, so that would probably make another run up in prices, okay? But then who knows exactly what's gonna happen. By the way, when people ask about interest rates versus home prices, I thought I'd share a very interesting chart with you. This is interest rates versus home prices going all the way back to 1975. From 1975 to 1981, there it is, interest rates on mortgages got all the way up to 18%. Crazy. And when real estate prices went up, guess what? Home prices went up. And real estate prices came down, I'm sorry, when interest rates came down, guess what? Home prices went up. And when interest rates went up and down, up and down, up and down, guess what, home prices went up. Now there are little bubbles here. That was that little 2008 housing bubble, remember that bubble, right? So there are little short-term spikes and bubbles, but for the most part, there's not much correlation between interest rates and home prices, other than home prices always go up, although from one year to the next, they might go up or down a little or a little less. So Texas, let's look at Texas, the average 
sales price for a house in Texas is $423,000. That's the average, and it's actually up 2%. Median price, uh, that's the average median price home, that's where the highest number of buyers and sellers are, uh, is $340,000. It's actually down uh, 1%. But the number that I look at more than anything else is this one right here in the middle, months of inventory, months of inventory. What does that mean? Let me put that in perspective. One way to look at inventory is this, months of inventory. If we stopped listing any more houses for sale, no more houses available and we're not gonna sell any more. Okay, we're gonna just sell what we got oh, until we run out. Uh, that would take three and a half months. We have three and a half months of total inventory. Right? which is also another way to look at that, that's the average amount of time it takes to sell any house, some more, some less, some much more, some much less. Now to put that in perspective, here's the saying. They say if there's more than six months of inventory, you have a buyer's market. If there's less than six months of inventory, you have a seller's market. If there's right around six months of inventory, you have a neutral market. We have, across the great state of Texas, 3.5 months of inventory. By any historical perspective, we are in a pretty strong seller's market. Now, it's not as strong as it was a year ago, where it was 2.6 months of inventory, but I would describe that as a virtually freakishly strong seller's market. Now, pending sales. Uh, pending sales is down a little bit and the amount of houses available, active listings, is up a little bit, which shouldn't be a surprise uh, because that's why the inventory has gone up. If you look at back over the last three years, 2021, real estate prices were up 18%, uh, almost 20%. 2022, prices went up another 10%. Uh, 2023, average prices are down 1%, or I would say flat. If you bought a house in the last year, you're looking at the market and saying it hasn't done anything. If you bought a house three years ago, you're looking at the market and say, wow, I'm a lot richer than I was three years ago. So congratulations, and that's just perspective. Let's jump into some of the other cities, starting with Dallas. So here we are in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, the average price, this is not a typo, in Dallas is 514,000. Uh, and it's actually up 3%, look at that. Uh, median price, uh, 406, down 1%. Uh, but look at this number. Now this is really interesting. Months of inventory in Dallas, 2.7 months of inventory. This is a strong seller's market in Dallas. And I don't know why this is, but we've been tracking this for 20 years. And I don't know why what I'm about to tell you is true, but I'm gonna tell you for 20 years it's true. Dallas has always been the bellwether for Texas. If you want to know what's going to happen in Houston and Austin, you look at Dallas. When the condo market goes down in Dallas, three months later, it goes down in Austin and Houston. It's, it's always ahead of the curve. I don't know why. I have no idea why. But if you go back 20 years, it's always ahead of the curve. And something interesting is happening in Dallas, and that is inventory is falling. And the market is heating up, interestingly enough. Total listings is actually up in Dallas, but only 5%, not much, right? Pending sales is down, uh, but only 16%. Uh, total closed sales, it's only down 8%, right? So it's very interesting. Now Dallas, going back three years, 2021, up 20%, great year. Uh, 2022, another great year, up another 15%. Dallas has got the best appreciation uh, in the uh, state of Texas. Uh, and this year it's flat, uh, so that's Dallas. Uh, diving into some of the other cities, Houston, a little more affordable, average price 420, uh, up two and a half percent. Median price down 0.3 percent, less than less than one percent. Months of inventory 3.3, a little more uh, than Dallas. Close sales down four percent, um, so not a whole huge uh, difference. Uh, Austin, Austin is the most expensive city. Uh, by a pretty good margin in Texas. Average price of a house in Austin, $583,000. That is not a typo. And we did a little research on this, and it turns out that Austin is actually Latin for San Francisco. Yeah, did you know that? Yeah, uh, the, the root Latin term. Well, yeah, no, actually Austin uh, is turning into uh, Silicon Hills, right? 
uh, Tesla, Amazon, Apple, all the high-tech companies, uh, Samsung, they're all building you know, factories and they're moving their headquarters uh, to Austin. Uh, and they're moving in all their high, uh, high dollar uh, employees, right? So they got a lot of six-figure people they're bringing in. Uh, and all that money and all those uh, businesses are uh, just uh, jacking up the prices uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, making Austin now the most expensive city uh, in Texas. And um, months of inventory a little higher, 3.8. Uh, but Austin had something a little different. Austin's unique in this way. 2021 in Austin, uh, prices went up 30% in one year, in one year. And I was there. And I got to tell you, there were months in Austin where we had 0.4 months of inventory, 0.3 months of inventory. That's less than two weeks of inventory. It's never happened before. And what was happening back in 2021, somebody put a house on the market for sale and they'd get nine, 10, 12 offers in a weekend, just like that. So the buyers would come in from California, wherever they're coming in, they'd put an offer, they'd get outbid. So they'd put an offer on another house, they'd get outbid. They'd put an offer on another house, they'd get outbid, right? 10 people making offers on every single house as soon as it came on the market. And so finally, the buyers just got so mad that they just started getting mad at the realtor and just said, I'm not getting outbid, just give them whatever it's gonna cost, right? And, and literally, people were buying houses well above the appraised value and just bring in the extra money to the table because the bank will not loan more than the appraised value, uh, but it became such a frenzy that it was kind of a freakish market for a while. And you know, less than two weeks of inventory, I mean, I've never heard of something like that. And prices in one year went up 30%. Next year, they went up another 10%. And then this year, it's settled down. Uh, in fact, Austin's actually had the correction uh, of about 10%. Now, if you look at Austin and Dallas over the last three years, they're the same, right? Uh, went up 30%, but the difference in Austin is it went up 40% and came back 10, right? Versus Dallas, which just kind of more gradually went up 30 and, and, and leveled off. Um, active listings uh, up a little, pending sales, uh, what is that, uh, up, up a little. Uh, but the volume's pretty much flat, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, obviously, all that run up of prices created a little housing uh, building uh, boom. Uh, and that bo building boom is, is, is now settling down, uh, and that's why the market's kind of adjusted. And Austin is the one major marketplace where prices have actually adjusted. Uh, and it's all perspective, right? If you bought a house last year in Austin, you're thinking, wow, the market sucks. If you bought a house three years ago in Austin, you're thinking the market's great, right? It's just perspective. And then finally, San Antonio, uh, the most affordable city in Texas, average price is 388, and it's flat. Uh, median price 322 down uh, 1%. 3.9 months of inventory, a little more inventory. Uh, sales volume down 4%. They went up 16%, 12%, and then down uh, 1%. So that's pretty much what's going on in the market uh, here in Texas. 